about how much matches you won for the country but happy to have records as well hit ball hit ball flies like magic dust coming at you people were astonished at uh, what murli could do it was like you're facing 14 balls all at once he's made a lot of batsmen look foolish but there are lots of times when he's made me look the same you felt that there was an opportunity every time he bowled. Morally had this kind of freakish genius. But you can argue to the end of the days whether it was an illegal action or not. He wanted to know, am I legal, am I illegal? Dedication, commitment, hard work, the passion that he had, uh, the enthusiasm he had for the team. The way he had brought the country together, uh, is something that we all should appreciate. And Sri Lankan cricket would never have got on the map without him. He was a magician, simple as that. I saw one boy bowling uh, fast and playing softball cricket. So I, so I got uh, thought that he's having something in him. So I asked him, uh, can you come for hardball practices at college? So he said that he has to ask his mother and let me know. He found me and said that uh, I, I look good in cricket, so just come and join uh, his classes. So I just got interested and uh, I thought of going to his classes where I can improve my skills. I asked Murali, can you uh, bowl off cutters? So he said, sir, I will try. It was Mr. Fernando who encouraged this Murali to uh, start thinking of bowling off spin because the team was short of a spinner and they had uh, too many fast bowlers. He bowled off cutters and I thought that he was bowling well and he got a spin. So that was the start. First match I bowled, I took five wickets uh, against another school as under 13. So from that day onwards, I became a spinner. I think in early 1990, the whole country was talking about this guy called Muttaya Murli Dharan. Murli Dharan was initially picked by Arjuna Ranatunga, first captain. Uh, they got him into the team and uh, uh, took him on a tour to England and the story is that um, he came over with a briefcase and in the briefcase he carried a leather ball. He'd go to the uh, hotel uh, room uh, window, stick his hand out with the ball and try and spin it, trying to get used to the cooler climate here. That's true but uh, that's the way you, you are nervous before you play a match and how you're going to do and it's the first time you're going to play for your country and uh, you'll be very nervous. So I was nervous and I did that. I didn't get much opportunity to play there, but when I came back and I joined Tamilunian. Having made an impression for his club side, Mattia Muralitharan finally made his test debut in 1992. At this stage, Sri Lanka had been playing test cricket for just 10 years, and were yet to claim a test victory on foreign soil. At home, we were comfortable, yes, we were winning matches or we were drawing games against good opposition, but away from home, we've hardly had any success. Kapil Dev used to tell Sri Lanka never uh, going to win the test match out of the country. As a team, uh, we still hadn't achieved much, no consistency, uh, but New Zealand was a turning point. In March of 1995, Sri Lanka finally broke their duck with a 241-run victory in Napier. Chamin Dawas bowled really well in that test match. He got uh, 10 wickets. Murli in the second inning, he held about five wickets and uh, we were very lucky to have in that match. Everyone was happy, first time ever we won a test uh, match and a series against New Zealand in New Zealand. We were very, very happy. 
that New Zealand tour gave the confidence that you know we could uh, achieve great things. In the same year in November, Sri Lanka went on to Pakistan and beat Pakistan 2-1 uh, in the Test series after losing the first Test match. Murli was amazing in that series. He took he took heaps of wickets and uh, he started to have a, a huge impact from there on from 1995 onwards. However, controversy was brewing due to accusations that Muralitharan was illegally straightening his arm during his bowling action. There were a lot of people in Australia, umpires and coaches and players, that, that were convinced that he wasn't, uh, he was an illegal bowler. We felt that uh, though Murali's action looked different, uh, it was still a legal action and uh, he was going to be a threat. And when that had, uh, does happen, when people do feel that here comes a threat, they try to nullify it. I think we've got a sensation on our hands here. There is absolutely no doubt that he's called him for uh, throwing. Umpire Hare is uh, the umpire who's doing it. He's decided that uh, his action is not uh, legitimate. So what he's saying is that he bent, he had his arm bent, and he straightened it. This is his livelihood, and all of a sudden, he's being no balled out of the game. Murali Duran is seeing his career float right out of the window. I was surprised, and uh, I didn't think it will happen ever. He came and said, first ball, no ball. I thought I just overstepped it. I think with just the, the natural, your eyesight, you would naturally think that Murray was, um, was throwing the ball. I just asked him and he said, you're not, you're not bowling, you're throwing. They called me about four times or five times and still I bowled. That means my other balls are OK. So I went to the other side and bowled and he didn't call. So that was unfortunate. After the first time, which was a surprise, um, the second time, they were ready for it. You have to react to whatever people throw at you, and uh, the Sri Lankans were expecting something to happen. Sri Lanka remained in Australia for a one-day tournament following the controversial Boxing Day test of 1995. And a week later, Muralitharan's action was called into question again. It looks to me as if umpire Emerson has called him for throwing. Well, that was a leg break. So um, he's called him for bowling a leg spinner twice in this over. And it's very difficult to, th to throw a leg spinner. Some say impossible. He actually had a laugh um, because um, they called on his leg spin as well a couple of times. So he was coming and saying, you can't bowl a leg spin with a bent arm. So they are just like targeting me. And I think he handled it really well. He was very confident that he could go and, you know, go through the testing and, and get it sorted. The technology was the thing that saved him. It was an illusion. Uh, it was something that you saw with your, your own two eyes in two dimensions. And you thought, well, gee, this bloke, uh, you know, he's got a bent arm. His wrist seemed to be able to turn in 360 degrees like a, a helicopter blade. Uh, and he was born with a deformity, which meant he couldn't actually straighten his arm completely. So that debate will go on forever. Well, you can argue to the end of the days whether they thought it was an illegal action or not. It was obviously deemed legal. Um, so I, we understand that. I guess our umpires probably were the ones that were sitting on the ICC match referees. Um, and, and the, the umpiring panels, they were the ones that initially called him. Um, and then it was all of our um, institutes which then cleared him. You know, so in that way, I guess there's this, this iconic um, connection to Australia. And it would be Australia that Sri Lanka met just 10 weeks later to decide the winner of the 1996 World Cup final. Sri Lanka were down uh, in, in lots of uh, aspects. There was a civil war on, and here was something, again, which brought everyone together. We didn't have nothing to lose in that final, you know, and we didn't have any experience, and a lot of teams in that time never thought uh, Sri Lanka going to win the World Cup and even to make to the final. There was a quite a bit of risk uh, when Murali got selected into that uh, squad of 14. If Murli was called again for chucking, the team had to play, for, play with 13 players. I think Captain Arjun Ranatunga took a big risk uh, in making sure that uh, he wanted Murli in the side. Arjuna was a smart captain. He wants to chase every time. Then the, the final is most important thing is everyone thought whoever bats first will win, but Arjuna chose to bat second because that's our strength. 
Arjuna Ranatunga's decision paid off. Sri Lanka chased down Australia's total of 241 in 46 overs to win the World Cup final by seven wickets. I think that's, that 96 win gave everything for Sri Lankan cricket because players thought they are not any more pushovers and they can prove themselves, they can play well. So we as that team did such a good team, thing to Sri Lankan cricket. It was a case of, of Sri Lanka now suddenly uh, beating the world, um, especially beating Australia in the final. It was a, a vindication of, of um, our stand when it came to Murali. I think after 96, that's when he really kicked off, especially in Test cricket as well. I think his first three, four years in Test cricket didn't uh, took him much, but later on, when he got the confidence, when he got, when he learned how to control the ball, that's when he really, you know, went away from everyone else. It was during a one-off test against England at the Oval in 1998 that Muralitharan stamped his authority on Test cricket. When Arjuna won the toss and put England into the surprise of everyone, people were wondering, what has he done? And England went on to pile up a huge score, 400 plus. England scored about 400 runs, and I still I got seven wickets, but it was too much for a test match, 400 runs. The English batsman batted really well. The wicket did not have that much of spin. So Murali really had to work hard um, to get those wickets he took. The batsmen also need to get a special mention because they scored the runs so fast to get ahead of England, uh, gave Murali the opportunity uh, to go through the English batsmen. The second innings was just something special. I mean, the wicket was spinning, uh, it was slow, and um, every ball was like a grenade thrown at the English batters. I was fortunate to take nine wickets, and one wicket who went was run out. So that was a highlight of my test career. After the 96 World Cup win, Sri Lanka taking another step forward. And uh, it was an outstanding game of cricket. No one really expected Sri Lanka to pull it out of the bag. With that uh, one-off test match win, uh, England recognised uh, the quality of Sri Lankan cricket. And since then, they've been giving three match test series, uh, both home and away. Uh, obviously, thanks to Murali. A little under five months after Muralitharan had claimed 16 wickets for 220 runs, Sri Lanka and England met again, this time in Australia for a one-day international. They would be umpired by Ross Emerson, the man who had no-balled Muralitharan against the West Indies in 1996. I knew Ross Emerson from before, and I thought the guy would call him in Adelaide, and Sri Lanka said, no, no, no. Look, he's, he's played five years now since 95, and four or five years later, no, no troubles anywhere else in the world. No, that won't happen. But it did happen. And, um, you know, the Sri Lankans stopped the game when it happened. I think Ranatunga had to make a stand. He had to make a statement. The Sri Lankans le left the field. They didn't quite leave the field. They, they stayed on the boundary line whilst calls were made. We knew that um, a lot of people will try to keep him down, and it was important to look after him. Although the match resumed, Arjuna Ranatunga was charged with five breaches of the ICC's code of conduct for his role in defending his bowler. Ultimately, Muralitharan was again cleared by the ICC following scientific tests. Shortly after this, the off-spin bowler went about perfecting a new delivery. When the Dushra came, it was double trouble for batsmen. <laughs> it's trying to get the ball to go away from the batsman, and he's an off-spinner which generally does turn into a right-hand uh, right batsman. So the Dusra is the right-arm off-spinners, googly, you would say. So you just try to flick it off the back of the hand and try and get it to move away. Things like that change the concept of we having uh, the idea of, yeah, we need to put out bowlers that are, that are sort of technically correct and they have uh, the perfect drift or whatever, but uh, Murali uh, had a, a completely new dimension to it. I think Saklane Mushtaq might have been the first player to bowl it from Pakistan. 
quite often we used to talk about the grips and the, the philosophy, and the training, uh, which muscle you use. We had quite few chats. So I just adopted way of doing the, doing the thing on my own way. And 1998, 99, I introduced by 2000, I was expert on bowling that. When Murli started bowling those dosras, then he became a lethal. Murali realized how good he was, and um, no one could stop him after that. By 2004, Mataya Muralitharan had become the youngest player to reach 500 test wickets. It had taken him just 87 tests to reach a milestone that came against Australia. It was just confusing and mesmerizing. Like, you'd see this little bloke sort of tippy toe in like a ballerina, and then big eyes and then come up over the top. Before you knew it, it was like you were facing 14 balls all at once. He'd bowl and he'd bowl flow. It was like magic dust coming at you. And my brain knew he was bowling off spinners, but because of his hand action, it looked like he was bowling leg spinners. So I knew it was going that way, but my brain was telling me it was going this way. So it was an absolute head blow. Of all the guys that really that we played, I think the most time that we spent over anyone in discussion would be Murali. However, with the relationship between Muralitharan and Australia, controversy wasn't far away. During the third test in Colombo, match referee Chris Broad reported Muralitharan's Dusra to the ICC. It would be the catalyst for changing the rules of cricket. See, it always happens, uh, these things, so keep on going testing every time they come up. And I have had a problem in 2004. He always said that he wanted to know whether he was legal or not. He, he didn't. He didn't change anything when he came to the lab. He bowled exactly the same because he had such high standards that he he wanted to know: Am I legal? Am I illegal? The problem for the ICC was that, having videoed every bowler virtually in international cricket, what they realised was that every bowler, to a degree or another, was straightening their arms. So they had to bring in a, a regulation to accompany the laws to say that bowlers were allowed to straighten their arms to a particular degree. All the world's bowlers were doing it, and the reason, I believe, why they chose 15 degrees was 80, 90 per cent of the world's bowlers fitted underneath that particular measure. Some people say the ICC changed the, uh, the laws about chucking. They introduced this 15 degrees of flexion simply to accommodate Muralitharan, but the fact is the game would have been a lot poorer without him. Finally in the clear, after nearly 10 years of accusations about his bowling action, Muralitharan got back to doing what he did best, taking wickets. I think he's probably the hardest bowler I've ever had to face, and, and for a number of reasons. One is the eyes, to start with. As he's running into bowl, you know, he's got these huge <laughs> eyes coming in looking at you. Secondly, you've got to try and figure out which way the ball's turning, which is quite scary, you know. If you don't know which way the ball's going, it's, it's quite a daunting prospect. Uh, and you could... I, I felt like I could probably pick it 70% of the time, so that's not a not great. And then thirdly, it's the revs he gets on the ball. It's, it's like a, you know, and you can really hear the revs on the ball as it comes down to you. And, and then lastly, there's normally probably four chirpy Sri Lankans around the bat, chirping away the whole time. So uh, extremely challenging facing someone like Rory. He was carrying a team with with virtually no other bowlers. They had Chaminda Vas, a very skillful left-arm seamer uh, who operated about 80 miles an hour and did clever things on flat pitches. But once Vas had gone and the shine had gone off the new ball, it was basically Matai Muralitharan versus the opposition. It was him, really, and more than anybody, who managed to haul that Sri Lankan team from being a team of also rounds with a few talented cricketers, but not particularly competitive, to becoming a force in test cricket. When you have a world-class bowler, you know you're going to win matches. And it's about then the batting group getting together and making sure you put runs on the board and, and creating those situations for us. So even though you don't think about it, you then work as a group to accommodate a world-class bowler. And um, Murli was that guy. On the 3rd of December, 2007, Muralitharan took his 709th wicket against England in Kandy. In doing so, he replaced Shane Warne as the all-time leading wicket-taker in the history of Test cricket. Sri Lanka was here, Australia was there. So I think it's, 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 it's unbelievable if you see Morley's record and, and, and Shane Warne's record. That was very, very pleasing and uh, uh, it was very happy to do that. And uh, I always thought 
whoever plays longer will have the record. So I was lucky enough to be younger than him. Shane Warne was in amongst a great attack, you know, McGrath, Gillespie, Lee. Morally was almost carrying that attack on his own. It meant that he bowled a lot of overs, which put tremendous strain on his shoulder. Uh, but he also carried that responsibility throughout his career and he responded fantastically well. I have a lot of respect for Warney. I picked so many things from Warney as well. But my favourite and my, uh, whom I rate number one ever is Morelli. Murray always wanted those records, but never at the cost of, of the team's objective or the cost of playing for too long or uh, at, at the cost of, of, you know, everyone looking at him and thinking, oh, he's just playing on because he wants to do something or achieve something. It was never that case. Two and a half years later, the highest wicket taker of all time made the decision that the first test against India in 2010 would be his last. He had 792 test wickets to his name. I always thought I wanted to retire when I was in top, not because when people want me to go. Kumar was the captain at that time, and, and uh, we both said to him, you got three test matches, you know, you can finish it off in, in Colombo, his home cricket ground. And he just looked at us and he said, no, but that's, that's ridiculous for me, because that's not what I want to do. I want to take eight wickets in this match and be done with it. If I take it, it's great because I want to do it. It also means if I take the eight wickets in this match, we'll win. But if I don't take it in this match, I don't want to come back and play again because that's not who I am. He had made up his mind that whether he got there or not, he was moving on. And that was a big decision because uh, for a bowler to get to 800 wickets, you have to play for such a long time. I had about eight wickets to take and best, at the time, best batting line in the world. So Sachin, Ganguly, um, Lakshman, Ravid, Shevag and this, they were playing well as well. So I choose the right wicket as well because goal is always a um, spinning friendly wicket. He was stuck on 799 with India 9 down for quite a while. If he had not taken that wicket, it would have been a tragedy. But Murray would have been able to accept it and move on and he would never have put himself above the team. And that's, I think, again, Murray in a nutshell. Getting that last wicket on his last ball in a test match and uh, getting 800 wickets, winning the test match, can't, can't ask for anything else. You can't write a better script than that. It was so pleasing that I could end up with 800 exactly what I wanted. Mattia Murilitharan retired from international cricket in 2011. He remains the highest wicket taker in test cricket and has taken the most five and ten wicket hauls. He is also the highest wicket taker in the one-day format of the game. I was fortunate enough when I was retired and I continued to play a few more months and finished the World Cup final as well, came to final and we were unfortunate we lost. And also I continued to play for IPL and other leagues in 2020. We were playing IPL together at uh, Chennai Super Kings and all he does is just talk about cricket all day, all day, every day. So in the Chennai team, no one wanted to sit next to Murali on the plane. And I thought, well, I will. Oh, so I put my hand up. Every flight, I'm happy to sit next to Murali. I remember um, sitting, you know, it was like 4A, 4B, 4C on this flight uh, in the IPL. And they're arguing about who is really, truly the Mr Cricket. You know, that's how much they love the game. Anyways, I, um, I just got sick of it and as you do on flights, you know, the altitude and a bit of food, I was like, <sighs> fell asleep. And so we would just be chatting on the plane or, you know, every single flight and uh, I was loving it. You know, I was learning so much from the master and uh, so I was loving it, whereas Haydos, he wouldn't even remember because he would have been sound asleep on, you know, in one of the other seats. So he, he, he's got no, no need to get in, entered into this argument whatsoever. And I woke up, you know, sort of as we started the descent with the captain announcing, and Murali still talking, who was against the window, and Huss is now asleep. You know, so I realised at that point that whilst Mr Cricket, Mike Hussey, is known as that, actually the truth of it is that the real Mr Cricket, the person that I've, without any doubt, loves the game more than anyone else on the planet, is actually Murali. He gave me more headaches and more sleepless nights than any of the fastest of bowlers. 
because I couldn't pick him. I couldn't work him out, and he was he was ruthless. Most batsmen thought they had to defend against him, and that makes his haul of 800 test wickets all the more remarkable. 800 plus wickets in a test match cricket, that's really special. I mean, what a champion human being. I, I, I just... I just totally respect him. All Murli told me was, you know, I can have turn and dusra or whatever, but my greatest strength is to be able to run in with my eyes closed and deliver a ball exactly where I wanted to pitch. And that's Murli. Throughout, the people were supporting me, so that's why I could overcome all the obstacles. All the captains who I played under, and also all the senior players and the players who played with me still in good terms with them and I'm happy with them. And also the public. So public is give everything to me because this game is, if the people doesn't watch, uh, there is no cricket. 